From the early morning, Emily was not in the mood. She worked as a nurse in the hospital and always showed empathy towards the patients, but on this day, irritation overwhelmed her. Everyone seemed to only think about themselves, their ailments, low salaries, and family problems. No one cared about Emily's problems. It felt like the whole world was against her. Olivia from the surgical department, her friend, added fuel to the fire. When they met in the nurse's station, Olivia enthusiastically asked, Hey, how was it yesterday? Did you have a good time with William? Emily looked at her gloomily, and her friend's smile faded. I can see that it was terrible. Will you tell me what happened? And why are you looking at me as if I'm guilty of something? Is your conscience clear? Emily inquired. It seems so, Olivia shrugged. Don't keep me in suspense. If you're going to punish me, at least tell me what for. Did you intentionally set me up at the club? Emily said reproachfully. Can you deny it? Well, yes, Olivia admitted. I wanted you and William to get along better. I thought I was helping you. With William? Get along? Did you really think I wanted that? He had zero intelligence. All he had on his mind was beer. There was nothing to talk about with him, and you decided to set us up. I'm sorry, I didn't realize, Olivia mumbled. You wanted a husband yourself, so I left you alone didn't want to interfere. I thought you liked him. No, Emily shook her head. He was awful. I dream of forgetting about our meeting, about going to that club. I will never go there again. There's nothing to catch. So, what happened after all? Olivia asked. The same as always. He drank too much beer and started hitting on me. I barely escaped from him. Why do all the guys I meet turn out to be troublemakers? I just want to meet one decent guy. Don't be upset. Your luck will change. Olivia reassured her. Where do you plan to meet someone if not at the club? Are you going to put up an ad on a dating website? No. I won't go there either. I've had enough of that. You know him well, Emily sighed. I guess I'll just go through life alone. That seems to be my fate. She didn't say this for the sake of hearing comforting words from her friend. She truly considered herself unlucky. In her 25 years, Emily had never been in a serious relationship. In school, of course, she had a crush on her classmate Liam, but it was all quite childish. They kissed a couple of times, and that was it. She was just an ordinary girl with a rather ordinary appearance, so she didn't expect a Prince Charming. All she wanted was to find a decent, good guy. But where were they all? Emily kept encountering strange types who didn't spark an ounce of romantic feeling in her. Middle-aged long-haul truckers who seriously invited her on a tour to the capital, heavy drinkers who never missed a skirt, suspicious characters who made her hold onto her purse tighter at first glance. Normal guys never crossed her path, and now she had given up on clubs as well. Emily couldn't imagine where she could meet the one. Another disappointment with William, who started with compliments but ended up with drunken bragging, had deeply affected her. She performed her duties at work listlessly and was quieter than usual. Some of the patients noticed this. Some remained silent, not wanting to bother Emily with their problems, but Gwen asked directly, What's going on, Emily? Is something wrong? I can see that something has happened to you. You can't hide anything from me. The elderly woman had visited the clinic for a course of injections several times, and Emily knew her well. Gwen was a reserved woman, but she had become attached to the nurse. She addressed her informally and gave her small gifts on occasion, like a distant relative or a godmother from the neighboring town. 
No, nothing, Emily forced a smile. I just didn't sleep well last night, and now I have a headache. Don't pay attention to it. Gwen rolled her eyes wearily and sighed heavily, as if Emily had disappointed her hopes. My dear, you're not good at lying at all, it's written all over your face. Problems with a guy, I assume? At your age, it's the biggest disaster that can happen. Tell me, I might be able to give you some advice. Is he fooling around, drinking, or all of the above? Emily found all these assumptions amusing and said, worse, actually. She continued, there is no him and there never has been, to be honest. I'm starting to doubt that soulmates even exist in this world. That's how it is. Gwen shook her head and replied, not much of a loss. It's better to have no fiancé at all than one who gets on your nerves for any reason. At least you'll preserve your health. But you young people don't understand that. Relationships come first for you. I'm not that young, Emily muttered. I'm already 25. Well, when you're 70, then we'll talk. Even I, retired and all, don't consider myself an old lady. And men still turn their heads when I pass by. So don't be down, understood? Yes, understood, Emily said meekly. I'll try. She wiped the injection site with cotton and nodded at the woman. That's it. Thank you for talking to me, Gwen. You've comforted me a little. Gwen continued to sit in her chair and showed no intention of leaving. She stared so intently at Emily that it made her uneasy. What? Is there something on my face? Emily asked. The response Gwen gave was a complete surprise to Emily. Emily, how would you feel about meeting my son? Emily silently looked at her. She didn't think that Gwen was joking. Gwen, in principle, didn't know how to joke. But this straightforward matchmaking took her by surprise. With your son? Emily hesitantly asked. Yes, Gwen nodded. With Edward. Maybe you remember, I told you a bit about him. How he excelled in grad school, for instance, and won all the Olympiads in school. It seemed like Gwen was advertising her son. Emily felt completely embarrassed. She did, in fact, remember those stories about Edward. She didn't know what he looked like, but through Gwen's conversations, she knew everything about him. About how well he did in school, all while attending a chess school and a club. How he astonished the entire institute with his talents, even the rector shook his hand. How he was accepted into grad school from the entire pool and successfully defended his dissertation. In other words, according to these stories, Edward was an ideal, almost angelic. Emily couldn't fathom how she had the privilege of meeting this guy. Gwen didn't wait for her response, got up from the chair, and decisively said, Come to our house for lunch this Sunday at noon. The address is in my medical records. Edward and I will be waiting for you. She smiled at Emily, patted her on the shoulder, and walked out the door. Emily was left in complete astonishment. What was this? Matchmaking? She had never experienced anything like this, and Emily wasn't sure she wanted to find out what it was like to meet a guy because someone else had set it up. When Emily told Olivia about it, she became very agitated. Some old lady wants to introduce you to her son? Seriously? Will you actually go? I don't know yet, Emily mumbled. Honestly, I don't want to. Gwen told me so much about her son, so many awards and achievements, and all I have is a medical college degree. What will I even talk to him about? Forget about all that nonsense. Olivia exclaimed. You're making yourself out to be some kind of failure in front of this nerdy scientist. I bet this Edward guy is just a regular loser. 
probably spent his whole youth buried in books, never went out, never experienced anything. And he probably never had a girlfriend. What would you even talk about with him? Emily smirked. Don't get so worked up. I haven't decided anything yet. Why don't you just go there? Olivia suggested. Why all of a sudden? Emily asked in surprise. Olivia, I don't understand you. First, you describe this Edward as a typical loser, and then you advise me to meet him. It's like you're giving me conflicting advice, isn't it? Olivia shrugged. Think about it yourself. What do you have to lose? If the guy turns out to be nothing special, then it's better for you. You can say fate led you to a decent option. Plus, your future mother-in-law is already on your side from the start. Not many people get that lucky, right? What if he turns out to be a terrible person? Emily asked. Ugly, boring, only talking about butterflies? Or whatever he wrote his dissertation on. Then you'll just have a good lunch and laugh about this meeting, Olivia grinned. You can think of your latest suitor as a walking joke, a peculiar date. It'll make for a good story to tell when you're older. Emily thought for a moment and agreed with her friend. She had nothing to lose, really. If she and Edward didn't like each other, well, it wouldn't be the first time. She had already given up hope of finding her match, so why not have a little fun in the process? They chose her outfit for the occasion together with Olivia. Emily immediately ruled out miniskirts, suspecting that Gwen would never let her in the door in such attire. Jean seemed unfeminine and not romantic at all for a date. Olivia came to the rescue, bringing a plain, modest dress that she had only worn once. Put this on, she commanded. I don't wear stuff like this, but I bought it on a whim. Any mother-in-law will appreciate an outfit like this. It's suitable for going to a convent. I thought it would never come in handy, but look, it's perfect now. Emily put on the dress and looked at herself in the mirror. She did indeed look dignified and modest. Neither Gwen nor her son could find fault with her in this outfit, no matter how hard they tried. Besides, the blue color complemented Emily's eyes beautifully. This is just what I need. Thank you, Olivia. I don't know what I'd do without you. Probably rummage through my closet for the rest of my life. You can thank me when you go to the registry office, her friend waved her hand. For now, it's not a big deal. I hope if everything goes well, you won't forget about me and invite me as a witness to your wedding. Deal? Who else would I invite? Emily laughed. You're my only candidate. That's great. Olivia smiled. Now, let's get to the makeup. I don't know what kind of modest nun they're expecting, but you won't go to battle without camouflage. At least we'll put on some mascara. Thanks to her friend's attitude, Emily began to think of this meeting as a fun adventure. Just another date and nothing more. And let that brainy scientist think whatever he wanted about her, despite all his knowledge and accolades, he probably wouldn't be able to administer an injection or change a bandage. And those skills would be more important than knowledge about butterflies. Emily approached the designated house and took one last look at herself in the mirror. She appeared quite simply yet charming, just like a modest bride should. It was time to confidently ring the intercom. Emily? Gwen's delighted voice came through. I'll buzz you in, dear. As Emily ascended the staircase, a sudden unease washed over her. What had seemed like a harmless little rendezvous from a distance now made her doubt the whole idea. Why? It was clear from the start that she and the professor were not a match. Gwen greeted her at the doorstep. Come in, Emily. It's wonderful that you came after all. I've set the table in the living room. 
Emily walked into the room hesitantly. She would have preferred to enter with Gwen, or even better, hide behind her. She had no idea who might be waiting for her inside. So, she entered the living room feeling like she was stepping into a dragon's lair. But there was no dragon. Instead, a man in glasses sat at the massive table, engrossed in a book, presumably Gwen's son. Edward didn't immediately notice the arrival of the guest, which gave Emily some time to study him and draw a few conclusions. The man appeared to be in his early thirties, wore glasses, and had a receding hairline. However, his overall appearance had a youthful quality, perhaps due to his smile. He held a thick scientific book in his hands, but smiled as if he were reading a pleasant fairy tale. Emily shifted from foot to foot, and the sound of her shoes scraping the floor finally caught Edward's attention. Mom, listen to what they're saying. He raised his head, spotted Emily, and stopped smiling. His gaze took on the same awkwardness that Emily had been feeling. Edward closed the thick book and extended his hand. I'm Edward. Nice to meet you. Emily nodded and replied, Emily. A moment of awkward silence lingered between them. To break it, Emily asked the first thing that came to mind. What are they writing about? Seems like an interesting book, Emily asked. Edward shrugged awkwardly. I'm not sure how to explain it. Do you have any knowledge of ecosystems? Only what I learned in school, Emily replied. Then you probably won't appreciate the humor in it. It's better if I don't explain. Emily wondered if Gwen was also knowledgeable about all these biological intricacies. Maybe she, too, was a professor and Emily had been unaware of it. Gwen entered the room carrying a plate of pie. Have you two met? Gwen asked with a smile. That's good. Edward, take care of our guest and pour her some fruit punch. Edward nodded, yes, mom, right away. Emily sat at the edge of her chair while Edward hurriedly served her with a pitcher. It was clear he was in a hurry and afraid of making a mistake. His hands were slightly trembling. Unfortunately, Things took a turn for the worse as Edward poured a glass for Emily instead of his mother. He tripped over a rug, spilling a significant portion of the drink onto her lap. Emily stared in disbelief as a stain spread across her dress, rendered momentarily speechless. Oh my goodness, Edward stammered, I didn't mean to. I'm so sorry, please forgive me. Emily shook her head and tried to force a smile. It's okay. Accidents happen. In reality, she was already calculating how to make a graceful escape from this situation. She had grown weary of this gathering even before it began. How could she leave now, though, with a stained dress? Gwen gestured in dismay. What a disaster. Don't worry, Emily. We'll fix it. I'll find you something else to wear, and I'll take care of your dress. Come with me. Emily wasn't thrilled with the idea since leaving without her dress was impractical. But she couldn't think of a way to refuse, so she reluctantly agreed and followed Gwen into her room. Gwen began rummaging through her closet, pulling out some ancient dresses and inspecting them critically. Here, I think this should work. Gwen finally said, handing Emily a dress from the 1980s with frills and ruffles. Try it on. Emily felt terribly awkward, but still took the dress, ruffles, and all. She wondered what her friend Olivia would say if she saw her like this. She probably wouldn't be able to contain her laughter. It's just right. Gwen nodded approvingly when Emily put on the dress. Now... Go back to the dining room, and I'll take care of your outfit. Reluctantly, Emily returned to the living room, expecting Edward to laugh at her appearance. However, he surprised her by complimenting her new look. It suits you very well, really, he said. Thank you, Emily replied. Let's switch to two, okay? 
Edward enthusiastically agreed, of course. I got tired of the constant formalities even back at the Institute. I didn't want to hear them at home. They fell into a brief silence, gazing at each other. Then Edward spoke again. My mom has told me a lot about you. Emily had heard similar phrases many times in classic literature and assumed it was a standard polite expression. She couldn't resist and asked, oh, really? What did she say? Now it was Edward's turn to find a way to put things delicately. He replied that you're the best nurse she's ever had. Your injections are so gentle that you don't even feel the pain. And you're very kind. My mom has suffered from hypertension for many years, went through a lot of treatments, and met numerous nurses. Believe me, she can make comparisons. Emily thought a little. Edward's words sounded sincere enough to make her believe him. Gwen told me about you too, she answered. What? About your dissertation, school grades, and student scientific conferences. Oh, and also about how you had jaundice and chickenpox in your childhood, Emily chuckled. Edward blushed, and Emily hurried to reassure him, it doesn't mean anything. I work in the medical field, so people tend to share these details with me. He managed a shy smile. Gwen called him from the bathroom, asking for help to hang up a dress. Edward, come here, I need help hanging up the dress, she said. Edward hastily jumped up from his chair, almost knocking it over, and rushed to the bathroom. Emily shook her head. Her friend was right. This setup felt like something out of a comedy. It was just another amusing memory of her youth. The rest of the meal went smoothly. They enjoyed the pie, engaged in polite conversation, and no further mishaps occurred. Although Emily didn't understand anything about Edward's scientific work from his explanations, Gwen skillfully inserted relevant comments into the conversation, saving the day. Seeing Emily to the door, Gwen said, I hope you enjoyed your time with us. Edward and I did our best. Of course, Emily replied. The pie was delicious, and overall... She struggled to find the right words to compliment and eventually settled on, thank you for the invitation, I had a great time. Emily hurried to leave before Edward could appear again with another lecture on butterflies. She couldn't wait to share the news with her friend. How did it all go? Olivia impatiently asked as soon as she picked up the phone. Tell me quickly, have they proposed to you yet? Can I book a restaurant? If anything, it's just a cafe, Emily chuckled. So we can sit there and lament our miserable youth because it went horribly. Did he insult you? Act like a pompous peacock, spouting off his intelligence and all that? He did talk about science, but he didn't insult me. There was nothing like that, Emily replied. Nevertheless, it was awful. I've never been so bored at someone's place before. We endlessly discussed Edward's scientific papers, his accomplishments, and to make matters worse, I have to disappoint you, he spilled compote on the dress you lent me. The stain didn't come out completely, I'll, of course, pay for it. Olivia burst into laughter on the other end of the line, you had me worried for a moment there. Spilled compote? That's a classic. Well, at least it wasn't a proposal. Now you have a funny story to tell. Emily couldn't help but laugh along with her friend, realizing that even though the date was a bit of a disaster, it did provide some amusing anecdotes. Forget about it, her friend said graciously. I was planning to throw the dress away anyway, so you're doing me a favor by taking it to the trash. Is that all? Nothing else bad happened? As if that wasn't enough, Emily sighed. Unfortunately, something did happen. I lost an earring somewhere. It might be in their apartment when I changed into the replacement dress. And I really liked that pair. You remember, 
the ones with the cubic zirconia? They spent the rest of the evening discussing the unsuccessful dinner. The next day, to console themselves, the friends met up at a cafe. They each had a pastry and laughed about Emily's date, now with a sense of humor. They also talked about Gwen's phone call. She somehow obtained Emily's number and called her the next morning to feel out the situation, as Olivia put it. Good morning, Emily, Gwen said in a sweet tone. I hope I'm not disturbing you. No, not at all, Emily replied politely, though at that very moment, she was busy making breakfast. Please, go ahead, Gwen. Did something happen? Is your blood pressure acting up again? Fortunately, no, Gwen chuckled. Your injections work wonders. Thank you so much for that. I'll be sure to recommend you to my friends. Now, why are you calling me? Emily wanted to ask, but, of course, she refrained from being so blunt. Gwen, however, shifted to the topic herself. I wanted to ask how you found Edward, she said. I won't hide it. I like you, and I would be pleased to have you as my future daughter-in-law. So, I'm calling to get your impression of your meeting with him. Emily hesitated, then replied, Your son seems like a very nice person, at least that's how it appeared to me. But I can't say more than that, we hardly know each other. Of course, Gwen reassured her. I wasn't expecting love at first sight, that only happens in romantic novels. Perhaps my son may have seemed a bit dull to you, but that's because he doesn't know you yet. You know, my husband, Edward's father, was like that too, very modest and intelligent. You wouldn't call him a heartthrob or a handsome man, but he had a true romantic soul. So, Edward is similar, it's hard to understand him at first glance. Emily thought that she could forget about this incident, bury it deep in her memory, and move on to something more pleasant. But that wasn't the case. A couple of days later, the professor found her himself. He knocked on the door of the treatment room where Emily was working. Come in, she said, not looking up from her paperwork. The door creaked open slightly, and Edward's bespectacled face peeked into the room. Hello, Emily. It's me again. Emily let out a barely audible sigh and adjusted the papers on her desk, hoping that this simple action would hide her discomfort. Hello, Edward. We agreed to address each other informally, remember? Of course, he replied, and entered the room. The conversation continued, with Emily and Edward discussing their first encounter and the subsequent phone call from Gwen. Emily's feelings remained mixed, and she couldn't help but wonder what might happen next in this peculiar chapter of her life. The man smiled and said, I apologize. I thought that these rules didn't apply within hospital walls, so I wanted to be cautious. They apply everywhere, Emily reassured him. Come in, have a seat. I hope nothing happened to Gwen. Mom is fine, Edward assured her. I came here for a different reason. Here. He opened his hand and placed the earring on the table, the same one that Emily had been sad about losing. Emily smiled and said, Thank you. I thought I'd never see it again. I found it while vacuuming in my mother's bedroom, Edward explained. I recognized it immediately as yours. Thank you, Emily repeated, taking the earring and putting it in her pocket. They sat in silence for a moment, then Edward unexpectedly said, I'd like to apologize for that dinner. It all turned out so awkwardly. My mom is persistent about wanting me to get married, so she keeps looking for potential candidates. She doesn't understand that nothing good will come of it. I'm 35 years old, practically an old bachelor. If I haven't found my bride yet, there's no point in trying. Emily looked at him in surprise. Everything he was saying resonated with her own thoughts and what she had been thinking about herself. 
She had considered Edward a dull guy, obsessed with science, but it turned out he had just become disillusioned with life and love. Just like she had. Suddenly, she felt sorry for him. Without much thought, she made an offer. What if we just go for a walk in the park without any matchmaking intentions? Just as friends. I have a feeling that we're two of a kind. Edward looked at her in amazement, then smiled. I'm not against that. They agreed to meet in the evening when Emily would finish work. They went for a walk in the park and, at Emily's suggestion, stopped by a cafe. Edward was bashful confessing that he had never been to a place like this with a woman before. He usually only went to cafes during corporate events. And not for the last time, Emily assured him, They bake such delicious pastries here, we'll definitely come back. She couldn't believe that this was real. Edward, the nerdy bookworm, was actually appealing to Emily. In the absence of his mother, who constantly steered the conversation towards science, he was a pleasant conversationalist and even attempted to make jokes. In his company, Emily felt light and at ease. You've gone mad. Olivia exclaimed when her friend met Edward for the second and then the third time. You said yourself that you could die of boredom with that guy, and now you're only hanging out with him. Edward isn't that bad, Emily defended him. We got to know each other better, and I realized that he's just very modest. He's more relaxed around people he knows. Can I meet your parents? Edward asked at one point. You've met my mother, but I don't know any of your family. It doesn't look good. Emily sighed. I'd be happy to introduce you, but unfortunately, besides Olivia, I don't have anyone in the world. My mother passed away when I was very young, and I barely remember her. I don't even know my father. As for my grandmother, she passed away three years ago. We're a little late for you to meet her. She would have been delighted to see you. As Emily and Edward spent more time together, they realized they had more in common than they initially thought. Their friendship blossomed, and they became each other's confidants. Over time, their connection deepened, and they both started to wonder if there was something more than friendship between them. Edward hugged Emily tightly, wanting to console her. He didn't say anything, but in his embrace, Emily felt peace and security. It was at that moment that she realized she was in love. Their wedding was grandiose. Gwen was ecstatic and wanted the whole world to know about it. She withdrew money from her savings account and rented a fancy restaurant. The guest list was extensive, but from Emily's side, there were only five people, Olivia and a few colleagues. However, it didn't matter to her. Throughout the evening, Emily watched her groom and felt like she had finally found her place. The problems began later, where they least expected them. The cheerful Gwen revealed her true colors after her son's wedding. The bride and mother-in-law's habits turned out to be too different. Their views on order and coziness in the house also clashed. Although Emily had never considered herself a slob, next to Gwen, she seemed exactly that. Emily couldn't find a better word to describe her mother-in-law. Gwen relentlessly visited the young couple's bedroom and conducted inspections. Emily, this simply won't do. Gwen sighed reproachfully, running her finger along the countertop. Dust should be wiped more often than once a week. You're too engrossed in concerts, that's what I say. Emily and Edward had indeed bought season tickets to the Philharmonic and compensated for the absence of a honeymoon with cultural outings. Or they would go to the movies for premieres. Edward was rarely home in the evenings, and Gwen was irritated by this situation. She believed that her frivolous daughter-in-law would lead her son astray. She also nitpicked about Emily's cooking. Too much dill, she complained impatiently while tasting the soup. She would find eggshells in the omelet and excess salt in the meatballs. 
but what bothered Emily the most was how Gwen treated her own son. Edward, what on earth are you wearing? She scolded when he put on a new suit that Emily had given him. It's a disaster. Look at the cut. You're a teacher, not a schoolboy. Or she would personally cut Edward's hair with clippers, not considering that a teacher might look more appropriate with a stylish haircut from a salon. And Edward accepted it all as a matter of course. It seemed he had long grown accustomed to such control. Finally, Emily's patience snapped. Enough, she exclaimed one day. Gwen, I understand that you have your ways of doing things, but this is our home now. You can't just barge in and criticize everything I do or how Edward dresses. We need our space and privacy. Gwen was taken aback by Emily's outburst. She wasn't used to anyone standing up to her. Edward, who had been silently tolerating his mother's interference, nodded in agreement. You're right, Emily, he said, finally finding his voice. This is our home and we should be free to live our lives as we see fit. Mom, we appreciate your concern, but we need to set boundaries. Gwen looked hurt but realized she had overstepped. She nodded reluctantly and left the room. From that day forward, Emily and Edward were able to enjoy their life together without Gwen's constant interference. They found a balance between their own way of doing things and Gwen's opinions, and their marriage flourished. Despite the initial challenges, they were happy together, and Emily knew she had made the right choice in marrying Edward. Darling, let's move, she said one night when Gwen was in her tenth dream and couldn't eavesdrop on them. Edward looked at her in surprise. Move where? Why? Emily carefully chose her words to respond. You see, she began firmly, I've always dreamt of having our own place. Please, let me finish. I know that this is your apartment, but I'm talking about something else. I'd like to have our own little family nest, where everything is exactly as I want it, not someone else. My furniture, life on my schedule. Taking a bath when I want, for as long as I want. You know what I mean, right? Is my mom bothering you? Edward asked, hesitating. It was astonishing how he had guessed right away. A little, Emily admitted. Just think about it, we're adults now. Maybe we should try living alone without someone else's rules? I'll try, he promised. But mom won't like this at all. It will be hard for her to accept our move. Hard? That was an understatement. Gwen threw a fit when she found out that her son was planning to leave. Move? But why, she asked in bewilderment. We have three rooms. There's plenty of space. Where are you going? To Emily's apartment, her son replied. You know, we've been renting it out for a while, and now the tenants want to leave. So, there will be an opening and we thought we'd give it a try. Edward's lie was a challenging one. He avoided eye contact and didn't seem very convincing. The truth was that the tenants had no intention of leaving, and Emily had spent a whole day using the most polite expressions to persuade them to do so. Give it a try? What does that mean? Gwen exclaimed. Try living independently, Emily replied for her husband. You see, we're both getting older, and we want to see what it's like to be grown-ups. Gwen burst into tears, nearly causing Edward to reconsider his decision. Emily squeezed his hand, which helped him stay resolute. Apologies, Mom, but I like this idea too, he said gently. You won't lose me. What are these notions? We'll come to visit you often, I promise. Emily was forced to confirm these words, although she didn't feel any joy in them. In one moment, she had turned into Gwen's worst enemy. Nevertheless, she celebrated secretly, she and Edward would be free. 
It felt like escaping from prison. The move to the new place was like a breath of fresh air for them. The apartment had just one room, but for the young couple, it was enough. They were blissfully happy. They spruced up the place with some minor renovations. Emily took charge of selecting the wallpaper, which brought her immense pleasure. She had no doubt that Gwen would have chosen some garish monstrosity for the walls. Finally, a contented wife sent Edward to the barber, and for the first time in his life, he smiled at his reflection in the mirror. Emily wore the dresses she liked without fearing disapproving comments from her mother-in-law. Gwen hardly ever called, and when she did, she cried on the phone. Nevertheless, Edward gradually regained his spirits. He even started taking driving lessons, something his mother had vehemently opposed. But Edward had made an independent decision in his life. A couple of months after the move, Emily realized she was pregnant. This news completely turned their lives around. Edward unexpectedly became animated and began making grand plans. We should exchange this apartment for a two-bedroom one, he said. Our little one needs a nursery, a corner of their own where they can do whatever they want. We also need to read up online on how to choose the right crib and buy some educational literature. And, I don't even recognize you, Emily smiled. Did someone switch my husband? I'll always be like this, Edward nodded with importance. Our child deserves a real father. Even Gwen, upon hearing the news, softened a bit and paid them a visit. Good day, Emily, she said, cautiously entering their apartment. I heard I'll be having a grandson or granddaughter soon. A boy, Emily nodded. Gwen teared up and said, little Edward. She was so moved that she even shed tears. Emily didn't argue with her about the choice of the baby's name. Perhaps Gwen was genuinely happy for her son and future daughter-in-law. Perhaps they could rebuild their relationship. Gwen embraced her role as a grandmother with such enthusiasm that it was almost intimidating. She read all possible literature about babies, found reputable doctors online, and knitted baby clothes. Emily hoped that Gwen would be a better grandmother than a mother-in-law. If not, she was confident she could assert her right to be the mother. Olivia was prepared for battle, too. If anything happens, you give that old witch a piece of your mind. You won't back down. And Edward, as you say, is no longer the pushover he used to be you'll get through. Emily agreed with her friend, but, as it often happens, trouble arrived unexpectedly without any warning. It occurred just before Emily's due date. One of Edward's friends invited him to a birthday party in the countryside. Edward felt obliged to attend, but was reluctant to leave Emily alone. Maybe I'll go with you. Emily finally suggested. You mentioned that the village is in a picturesque location. I'd like to take a walk by the river. Or perhaps our little one wants this. Edward winked. Let's go together. I'll congratulate Nathan, and then we can go for a walk deal? But he never got to fulfill this promise. The road was empty, and Edward, who had gained some driving experience, was driving confidently. However, no one could have predicted the accident. Out of nowhere, a dog ran onto the road. Edward swerved sharply to avoid hitting it, and the car veered off the road, crashing into a tree. Darkness Emily had no idea how much time had passed before she regained consciousness. It must have been a long time because everything had changed during her unconsciousness. She opened her eyes and saw a white ceiling. Some machines were beeping, and there was a hospital smell in the air. The scene reminded her of a childhood memory when she was in the hospital with bronchitis. Emily immediately understood where she was but couldn't figure out what had happened. Premature labor or... Emily remembered the road, Edward's frightened expression, and everything fell into place. 
They had been in an accident. There was simply no other explanation for what was happening. But what about her husband? And their baby? Emily touched her abdomen, which felt unusually flat and deflated like a balloon, and a chill ran through her. Then she shouted, Someone, come to me. A young nurse peeked into the room and hurriedly nodded, Are you awake? Wait, I'll call the doctor. No need for a doctor. Emily yelled. Please, just tell me, what happened to my baby? However, the nurse had already disappeared into the corridor, and it seemed like an eternity before the doctor she had gone to fetch finally arrived. He was a tall man of middle age, with a nervous expression. Upon seeing his anxious look, Emily became even more distressed. Doctor, for heaven's sake, tell me that my husband and son are all right, she pleaded. The doctor grimaced slightly and approached her, saying, How are you feeling? Do you have any pain? My soul, Emily replied, her voice trembling. Please, finally tell me about my family. The doctor sighed. It seemed like he didn't want to have this conversation at all. Tell me now, she insisted. The doctor sighed again, clearly uncomfortable with the task. Unfortunately, we couldn't save your husband, he said. The ambulance didn't arrive in time, and his death was instantaneous. Please accept my condolences. There it was, the loss. Emily could feel tears welling up in her eyes. And my son, she asked. The doctor sighed again and avoided eye contact. Emily felt herself growing to resent his mournful expression. We couldn't save your son either. I'm sorry. Emily remained silent in shock for a few seconds before breaking into tears. She didn't hear the doctor's explanation of her own condition. None of that seemed to matter now. Emily didn't know how much time had passed. Days turned into nights, and her physical and emotional state was horrendous. Edward was gone, their baby too. She moved around in a wheelchair, but she hardly cared about that. Every waking moment, she kept replaying in her mind how this had happened. And in her dreams, she kept asking Edward the same question. One day, as she was being wheeled to a procedure, Emily encountered Gwen in the corridor. Emily was taken aback. She had completely forgotten about her mother-in-law, and it seemed Gwen had forgotten about her too. Gwen. Emily exclaimed, hurrying towards her. You came to see me? Gwen turned slowly to look at her, her eyes icy. Emily shivered in surprise at the coldness in Gwen's gaze. To see you? Gwen replied venomously. Never. Murderer. My son died because of you. What are you saying? Emily whispered, bewildered. Isn't it true? Gwen continued, advancing on her. I took care of Edward, always did what was best for him. But then you came along, feeding him garbage, dressing him in rags, and then convincing him to get behind the wheel. And now you dare say you're not to blame for what happened. You should be put on trial. Emily, who was still struggling to master the wheelchair, became stuck, bumping into a trash can. Gwen was getting closer, and Emily was horrified by the impending confrontation. She had no idea how this would end until the head doctor emerged from his office. Gwen, the head doctor, called out to the woman. Please come into my office. I've been waiting for you. Gwen shot Emily one more venomous look before disappearing behind the office door. Emily breathed a sigh of relief, maneuvered the wheelchair, and quickly left the scene. The encounter with Gwen had left her bewildered. Where had such hatred come from? What had she done to deserve this? After a month, Emily was discharged from the hospital, and she chose not to go back home but instead headed to Olivia's place. Her friend was already expecting her. We haven't seen each other in how long? 
two months or more. Olivia fretted as she set the table, glancing over at Emily. I'm so sorry I haven't visited you. I had so much on my plate. Emily managed a faint smile. It's okay, I understand. You had your own problems. That was true. Olivia's father had fallen ill, and she had taken unpaid leave to go to another city to care for him. Both friends seemed to hit a rough patch simultaneously. Olivia sat down at the table and took Emily's hands in hers. What are you thinking about doing? Emily sighed. I need a complex surgery, and it requires a lot of money. That's why I came to you. Olivia nodded. I don't have much, but whatever I have, you can have. How much are we talking about? Thank you, Olivia, Emily said gratefully. But I'm not going to borrow money from you. You know, while I was lying in the hospital, I had a lot of time to think, and a decision came naturally. What decision? Olivia inquired. I'm going to sell my apartment. It's in a prime location. The proceeds should be enough for the surgery, and with whatever is left, I'll buy another apartment. Or at least a studio. According to my calculations, I should have some money left. You've become quite the accountant, Olivia remarked with a sad smile. All right, but what do you need from me then? Let me live with you while I sort out my housing situation, Emily asked. Of course, I could live in my apartment until it's sold, but I'm afraid I'll just go crazy from loneliness there. Olivia nodded understandingly, no problem, stay. If we go crazy, we'll do it together. It's more fun that way, right? That's why Emily loved her friend, she always found a reason to joke. She tried to forget, at least temporarily, about the loss of her husband and the unborn son. She had to get back on her feet, even if it meant defying Gwen and her unjust accusations. Unwillingly, her mother-in-law had given her the strength to carry on. The sale of the apartment dragged on, but it ultimately went smoothly. Then came the surgery and a long course of rehabilitation. It took many months before Emily was finally on her feet. By that time, she felt like a completely different person, stronger and more mature. Now, she felt ready for anything. Nothing suitable is available. Emily exclaimed in frustration, tossing the newspaper onto the table. Apartments are either too expensive or in terrible condition. Keep living with me, Olivia shrugged. I've gotten used to you being here, and I can't imagine being alone anymore. Emily looked at her closely, not alone, but with Daniel. Do you think I don't know he's in love with you? I'm just getting in the way. If this apartment were empty, you two might have been together a long time ago. That's nonsense. Olivia protested, not very convincingly. I don't want to interfere with your relationship, Emily repeated. So, I should move out. Her friend pouted, fine, if that's what you really want, I'll try to find a solution. A few days later, Olivia returned from work early and started a conversation. Do you really want to leave? Have you changed your mind? Emily shook her head, and Olivia sighed. All right, then I found something for you. There's an old man named Mr. Taylor who lives in a village not far from the city. He comes to our hospital for treatments. He's very old and doesn't have much strength left. He's selling his house for next to nothing with the condition that he can live out his days there. He has a decent temperament, doesn't get upset over small things like some people. So, I thought it might be better for both of you if you moved in together. You'll get cheap housing, and the old man will get his treatments without leaving home. I have a feeling he'll stop taking them because he's tired. It's funny to say this, but you two are like two halves of a whole. Two solitudes. And Emily agreed, she didn't really have much to lose. 
Mr. Taylor, the old man, appeared to be around 80 years old, hunched over with a gray beard. He didn't look very well, but when he saw Emily, he managed to smile. Ah, here's my new granddaughter. Let's get acquainted, dear. My name is Mr. Taylor. And your full name? Emily asked. Just Mr. Taylor. The whole village calls me that. I've gotten used to it. I'm Emily, she nodded. Nice to meet you. Living in the same house with a stranger old man was very strange, but Emily quickly adapted. Besides, she had lived with her grandmother before and was familiar with the quirks of the elderly. Mr. Taylor, like her late grandmother, despite his age, rose early and got right to work. His house was always spotless. Emily tried to help him, but he would always brush her off. You're my guest, I can manage, he said, and it was unclear whether it was hospitality or pride speaking. Emily tried not to argue. The house they lived in was quite old. Time seemed to have stopped here, with Soviet era carpets hanging on the walls, and the wallpaper had long faded. Several photographs hung above Mr. Taylor's bed, showing some people a woman and a little boy. One day, Emily dared to ask who they were. The old man sighed heavily and muttered, My wife and son, Billy. They. Emily hesitated to finish the question. They died many years ago, Mr. Taylor nodded. In an accident. My fault. He paused for a moment and added, Do you ever wonder why I chose you to be my tenant? Mr. Taylor asked. Olivia, the nurse, told me your story. I thought that if my own family couldn't live here, at least I could help you. Emily lowered her gaze and mumbled, Thank you very much. I didn't know, I didn't think. I try not to think about it either, Mr. Taylor replied. Just thinking about them tightens my heart and takes my breath away. Forty years have passed, but I still haven't gotten used to being alone. That night, Mr. Taylor began to feel unwell, just as he had predicted, memories of his deceased family had a profound effect on him. Emily woke up to the sound of something clattering in the next room. She jumped out of bed and hurried barefoot to her neighbor's room. Mr. Taylor Oh, my God. Are you okay? A shattered cup lay on the floor, and water had spilled everywhere. It seemed that the old man had tried to take a sip of water, but couldn't hold the cup. Mr. Taylor was breathing heavily and looked frightened. Emily whispered, everything will be fine, help is already here. Please hang on. She searched through his entire first aid kit, found the necessary medications and a syringe, and administered the injection. Her hands were trembling a bit because it had been a while since Emily had done this, but her experience and skill didn't fail her. Now let's call an ambulance, she said to herself as she dialed, just as a precaution. The ambulance arrived half an hour later, and during that time, Emily stayed by Mr. Taylor's bedside, whispering soothing words. By the time the doctors arrived, he was already feeling better. They decided not to take him to the hospital. Emily spent the entire night by Mr. Taylor's sleeping side, never taking her eyes off him. Then, quietly, she went about her business taking on the household chores. Mr. Taylor only got out of bed around noon and grumbled in protest. You've caused quite a fuss. I could have handled it myself. Don't complain, Emily playfully threatened, placing a plate in front of him. Today, I'm in charge. The old man didn't argue, apparently still not feeling strong. He ate slowly and watched Emily intently. Thank you, he murmured. If it weren't for you, there would be no old Mr. Taylor in this world. Emily smiled. You're welcome. The old man finished his breakfast and pushed the plate away. It's time to put an end to this, he said. Put an end to what, Grandpa? 
Emily asked, surprised. To this melancholy, my dear, Mr. Taylor replied. I look at you, and I'm afraid you'll live your life like I have, as an old hermit. Well, what's the difference? I'm not feeling melancholic at all, protested Emily. Oh, you are, you are, said Mr. Taylor. Can't I see the look in your eyes? It's like a dog that has lost its owner. Are you mourning for your family? Now, tell me, do you have a dream? Emily shrugged, then smiled sadly, I suppose. I'd like it if that accident had never happened. And what else? Mr. Taylor persisted. What do you want to do? I don't know. Administer injections? Well, that's not a dream, it's a duty. I'm already used to it. Maybe I'd like to grow flowers to make the world more beautiful and uplift people's spirits. Well, then, go ahead and grow them. Mr. Taylor said. Who's stopping you? Find what you love, and your eyes will start to shine again. But where will I grow them? Emily wondered. If not in the garden, which is small, and autumn is coming soon. So, there won't be any flower beds. We don't have a greenhouse. Build one, the old man ordered. Emily barely had time to express her surprise and tactfully mentioned that she couldn't afford to build a greenhouse. She had given everything for the house and was living here unofficially, essentially as Mr. Taylor's guest. Mr. Taylor hobbled into the basement and returned with a dusty box. Take it. It's for you. Emily cautiously peeked inside. It contained gold jewelry, antique earrings, bracelets, and more. What is this, Grandpa? She asked, stunned. Are these your precious belongings? No, Mr. Taylor shook his head. They're yours now. I found them a couple of years ago when I was breaking down the old shed and started digging up the ground. Someone must have hidden them there before the revolution, probably, Mr. Taylor continued. There used to be wealthy people living nearby, but they fled abroad. I kept thinking about whom to leave them to. I wanted to bury them again for someone to find in the future, but then you came along. Take them and sell them or give them to the state, it doesn't matter to me. And with the money you get, build a greenhouse and fulfill your dream. Emily vigorously shook her head. I can't take all of this. It's too much. Besides, for what reason? If you don't take them, I'll give them to Vasca the drunkard to spend on booze, the old man threatened. Choose what these funds will go towards, beauty or vodka. Emily had to comply. She turned over the valuables to the government, received the legal percentage, and started working on her flowers. She repaired the house and arranged for Mr. Taylor to receive treatment at a good clinic. The events that had unfolded had bonded them and made them closer to each other. Emily had already forgotten that Mr. Taylor was not her real family. Life went on. Emily became a successful businesswoman, but she didn't become arrogant. She still greeted her neighbors warmly and hired villagers to work for her. A couple of years later, she married a local agronomist named John. He was a good guy but carried his own emotional scars. He had been abandoned by his bride just before their wedding. Their challenging pasts, or perhaps their shared love for plants, brought them together. Emily had almost forgotten her past, occasionally remembering Edward with warmth as a bright period in her early youth. But one day... The past came back to remind her. Emily went on a business trip to the neighboring region to negotiate flower deliveries. After the meeting with the store director, she decided to take a leisurely walk in the park. The weather was beautiful, and the city was unfamiliar. Emily simply strolled and smiled at strangers, enjoying the wonderful day, when suddenly, Edward, where are you climbing? Get down immediately, you'll hurt yourself. 
Emily thought she was hallucinating. That voice, that name, everything was so familiar. She turned and spotted a woman shouting. It was Gwen, and Emily had no doubt. The same proud profile with an eagle-like nose, the chemo hair, and a little boy of about six sliding down a hill. He looked so much like Edward and Emily herself. Gwen scolded the boy loudly, leading him towards the park's exit. Emily, not knowing what she was doing, followed them. Her former mother-in-law never turned back, which was for the best. Emily wouldn't have had time to hide. She was completely stunned. There was only one thought in her head, this is my son. Emily followed them all the way to their home, a plain five-story apartment building in the city center, and rushed to call her husband. John initially tried to calm her down, convinced that she had imagined everything. But eventually, he believed her. Just don't do anything rash, he warned her. Don't scare her off. We'll contact the police. And they did just that. Although Emily was impatient to confront her former mother-in-law, the police handled it, and then the court. During the court hearing, Gwen cried. Forgive me. When Edward died, I couldn't bear it. I thought I'd die too. And then this boy, my grandson, appeared. I thought fate was giving me a second chance. This girl, well, she was promiscuous anyway. She couldn't raise a child properly. I hired the chief doctor to help me. I gave him everything I had saved up over ten years. He helped me, and now I had a new Edward. I was so happy. The story did not move the judge, and Gwen, as well as the head doctor from the hospital, were convicted. Little Edward finally found his mother and a father and a grandfather who gladly welcomed him, and a little sister. A few months after the trial, Emily found out that she was pregnant again. It took many years for Emily to forgive her former mother-in-law. Gwen was a cruel, heartless woman, but in some ways, she had been right. Fate did sometimes give second chances. Chances at happiness just like Emily had received.